She earned her PhD in history in 2007 from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and has been at Lehman College, a colleague of mine, since then. Uh, she recently published a very important book, uh, Puerto Ricans in the Empire, Tobacco Growers, and U.S. Colonialism, published by Rutgers University Press a couple of years ago. Uh, she's currently at work on a new research project that examines the movement of people within Puerto Rico internal migration from 1898 to 1940. She is involved, she continues her involvement with the Center for Latin America, Caribbean, and Latino Studies at the Graduate Center where she advises students in the enroll in the Masters of Liberal Arts program. At Lehman College, she teaches history of Puerto Rico, history of Latin America, and the Caribbean, and history of the Dominican Republic. With pleasure, leave you with Teresita. <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to celebrate the publication of Edgardo Melendez's book, Sponsored Migration, The State of Puerto Rican Post-War Migrations in the United States. And I am going to let my colleagues uh, let you tell you a lot more about the book, uh, but I cannot emphasize enough how important Edgardo's work is to our understanding of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. Simply stated, I love this book. Edgardo argues that the migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States must be understood as a colonial migration, one that occurred within the boundaries of an empire. Although official migration policy was to neither encourage nor discourage migration, as Edgardo argues, his meticulous research demonstrates that the colonial state was intimately involved in all aspects of the mass movement of Puerto Ricans to the United States including investing in the transportation infrastructure to facilitate migration, negotiating between laborers and contractors, pressuring the federal government for assistance, and creating education programs to ease the migrants' transitions into American society. Really, after this book, there should be no more debate regarding the role of the colonial state in the migration of Puerto Ricans from the island to the mainland. Uh, but Ricardo is not only a brilliant scholar, as I like to tell him, too much to his embarrassment, uh, but a generous friend and colleague. I cannot tell you the many, many times that I have reached out with questions about my own work or seeking his opinion about whether I was on the right track. And he not only answered my emails, but took the time to write very long, amazing uh, arguments for or against uh, what I was asking him to comment on. So I thank him for his friendship. I thank him for his work and for including me in this presentation tonight. <laughs> So tonight we will hear from uh, not only the author, but we will also hear from two other distinguished colleagues, uh, Ismael Garcia Colon and Arcadio Diaz Quinones. And Arcadio is on his way. He's running a little late, so we will make room for him when he comes in. Uh, so Ismael is the chairperson of the Sociology and Anthropology Department at the College of Staten Island and associate professor of anthropology at the Graduate Center, CUNY. He is a historical and political anthropologist with interests in political economy and oral history. He's the author of the book, Land Reform in Puerto Rico, Modernizing the Colonial State, 1941 to 1969, published in 2009. And the article, We Like Mexican Laborers Better, Citizenship and Immigration Policies and the Formation of Puerto Rican Farm Labor in the United States. His current research explores the Puerto Rican experience in US farm labor and its relation to US colonialism and immigration policies. Arcadio Diaz Quinones is a professor emeritus of Caribbean and Latin American literature at Princeton University. He has previously taught at the Universidad de Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. His publications include La Memoria Rota and El Arte de Bregar, as well as editions of El Prejuicio Racial en Puerto Rico by Tomás Blanco and La Guaracha del Macho Camacho by Luis Rafael Sánchez. His book, Sobre los Principios, Los Intelectuales Caribeños y la Tradición, was published in Argentina in 2006. He has also taught here at CUNY at Hostos Community College. And finally, we are going to hear from the author of himself, Edgardo Melendez. Edgardo is a full professor in the Department of, Latin, of Africana and Puerto Rican Latino Studies at Hunter College. Among his publications are Puerto Rican Government and Politics, a Comprehensive Bibliography, published in 2000, and also awarded the 2000 Outstanding Academic Title by Choice Magazine. Partidos, Politica, Publica y Status en Puerto Rico, published in 1998. Puerto Rico en Patria, in 96. 
Movimiento Anexionista en Puerto Rico, 1993, and Puerto Rico's Statehood Movement in 1988. He is co-editor with Edwin Melendez of Colonial Dilemma, Critical Perspectives on Contemporary Puerto Rico, published in 1993, and co-editor with our good friend also, Charles Vendor Santiago, of the special issue of Centro Journal, U.S. Citizenship in Puerto Rico 100 Years After the Jones Act, published this last spring. His forthcoming book is Patria, Puerto Rican Exiles in Late 19th Century New York City, uh, published by Centro here at Hunter. He has also published in several academic journals and is currently working on issues related to Puerto Rican migration, political incorporation, and citizenship. And the program for tonight will be Ismael, then Arcadio, and then finally Edgardo. And there will be plenty of time for you to ask questions of all three panelists. Um, so I will ask you to hold off until the end, and then I will um, make sure that everybody gets their word in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, to Senso for the invitation. Um, it is uh, an honor to be here uh, discussing uh, the book sponsored migration. Professor Edgardo Melinda was my professor at uh, the University of Connecticut. But you were very young. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that I was still, that I was still young. Young. Uh, but that doesn't preclude me of criticizing. No, uh, no. His work. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so, to the surprise of many people, there are still Puerto Rican migrant farm workers in the United States. In the immediate days of Hurricane Maria, I remember what a Puerto Rican farm worker in southern New Jersey told me in 2010, quote, we do this out of necessity. It is not easy to leave your family and come here to work. When there is a family emergency, you are not there for them. And all of a sudden, you have to take an airplane to go and help, unquote. I cannot imagine the anguish of hundreds of farm workers without knowing any news about their families and not able to travel to Puerto Rico. Last week, I watched uh, in WAP America, how an elderly woman dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Maria sent a message to her son working in a campo. Uh, she wanted her son to know that she was okay and expected him to be back from work in a month. Uh, October and November are the months when farm workers return to their homes. This year, some of them would not have a place to stay. I'm certain that the devastation caused by Maria would continue forcing them to migrate to the U.S. mainland. Before Hurricane Maria, and now I think most presentation is, is gonna be before and after. Yes. Mm -hmm. So before Hurricane Maria, and actually when I wrote this before Hurricane Maria, that's why I have to point out the, the Recent farm labor migration caused by the economic crisis in Puerto Rico was leading to news about incidents of discrimination and labor exploitation. In the summer of this year, headlines in social media and Puerto Rico's newspaper, uh, El Nuevo Día, described Puerto Rican contract <coughs> workers as being sold into slavery in Alaska's food processing factory. Last year, Latino Justice heard that, filed a case before the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission against an apple grower in Michigan for discriminating against uh, and unjustly, unjustly firing a group of Puerto Rican workers. In July of this year, Governor Rosselló Nevarez launched an investigation into such incidents, and now I don't know what that investigation is gonna go. These incidents, which are always common for Puerto Rican migrants, but the press is recently reporting them more often. This anecdote reminds us of the newspaper articles and editorials written about the plight of Puerto Ricans who traveled to Hawaii, Mexico, Cuba, and the United States during the first decades of the 20th century. Puerto Rico's migration policy emerged in part from the complaints of migrant workers and harsh 
fresh coverage of labor abuses, as well as from the modernization policies of the Popular Democratic Party. At the end of the Second War, labor contractors began to recruit in Puerto Ricans, offering jobs in US, US factories and farms. The complaints of mistreatment received by the government of Puerto Rico led to the creation of the Bureau of Employment and Migration and the Migration Division. Edgardo Melendez, a sponsored migration, is a timely book that shows us the relevance of these experiences and events for understanding contemporary developments in Puerto Rican migration. A sponsor migration is about the development of a migration policy by the government of Puerto Rico in the 1950s. As a general rule, a scholarship on mid, mid 20th century Puerto Rico explores the island's modernization by mills. Melendez describes how part of the official government policy was that as long as the migrant flow could not be prevented, the government would assist in eliminating conflicts of adaptation to the host communities. The government of Puerto Rico also insisted that host communities must understand migrants by my, migrants' background and facilitate their settlement. <coughs> Melendez thus argues that one can can understand migration policy better by examining how Puerto Rican officials press the federal government to declare, to declare Puerto Ricans as domestic workers. Puerto Ricans became uh, domestic workers in order to obtain preference for agricultural jobs in the United States. One of the most important contributions of these books to the study of Puerto Rican migration is, is attention to the infrastructure that the government of Puerto Rico created to uh, foster the flow of migrants. In chapter four, Melendez debunks the idea that tourism fostered the development of air transportation in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico. The expansion of public air transportation after the Second War became an efficient tool to increase farm labor migration. The government was instrumental in making air, transport, air, air transportation cheap, safe, and available to satisfy the flow of contract labor. <laughs> Thus, in the 1950s, the government of Puerto Rico enacted a plan for the construction of the international airport, uh, chartered flights for contract workers, lobbied for new airlines to start operations in the island, asked the federal agencies to control on a schedule on a scheduled flights and push for lower ticket costs. As a result of these policies, Melendez concludes that mass air travel became a means of furthering the connection of the United States to its colonial territories, uh, the colonial territory of Puerto Rico. English language instruction also became part of the infrastructure to facilitate migration. In chapter five, Melendez describes how the government of Puerto Rico increased English instruction while providing information about housing, employment, weather, and cultural expectations for potential migrants. And this, this is because they were hoping to ease the incorporation of Puerto Rican by preparing them them for the ethnologically alien United States. The Migration Division and Puerto Rico's Department of Education prepare audiovisual and written materials to foster uh, uh, the, the, the learning of English. Classes for adults and seasonal migrants, workers, and radio lessons were among the strategies to intensify the learning of English in Puerto Rico, as well as in state-side uh, labor camps. Luis Muñoz Marin declared that the goal of the PPD government was to make Puerto Ricans bilingual. As Melendez correctly points out, these policies accelerated the influence of English and American ideals 
in Puerto Rico more than previous efforts at Americanization. So it was the Puerto Ricans that basically intensified the uh, uh, Americanization of the rest of the population. Finally, chapter six deals with the Michigan incident where migrant contract workers protested about living and working conditions mm. and traces the political connections of Puerto Rico to Michigan. Congre Congressman Hoffer, who represented Michigan big growers, pressed uh, for the hiring of Puerto Rican workers. His friendship with Luis Muñoz Marin shows the extent to which the congressman was involved in the elaboration of migration policy. Operation Fan Lid transported more than 5,000 Puerto Rican workers to Michigan for the 1950 harvest. <coughs> Puerto Rico's Department of Labor mobilized immediately after receiving reports of protests and complaints from migrants. It was a disaster, Operation Fan Lid. Melendez argues that the Michigan incident changed Puerto Rico's migration policy because it prompted the implementation of new policies and guidelines for the movement of labor to the United States. The government of Puerto Rico became a labor contractor, the middle point between workers and employers. In my opinion, the incident reflected the travails and dilemmas of organized migration. However, and th this is my, my criticism just about this chapter, I believe that uh, the Michigan incident did not substantially affect the future of the farm, farm workers placement program and the migration policy of the government of Puerto Rico. And you can write a book about the whole incident, but I don't, in, in, and it's very interesting, the, the incident and reflects how the government of Puerto Rico dealt with the situation, but I, in my opinion, it didn't have uh, so much impact in the way that the government of Puerto Rico developed the farm workers uh, recruitment program uh, uh, in the 1950s and, and in later decades. To end, a sponsor migration emphasizes that scholars cannot divorce the analysis of mid 20th century policies of economic development, political autonomy, and modernity from the study of migration policy. Melendez also reminds scholars that they still need to theorize Puerto Rican migration. Looking at the formation of the colonial state and citizenship through the lens of migration policy demonstrates that transnational, transnationalism does not explain the relationship of Puerto Rican officials to federal agencies. In addition, scholars must ab abandon interpretations based on the definition of culture as whole systems, particularly those interpretations arising from theories of assimilation, be it the old interpretation of the melting pot or the new theory of segment segmented assimilation by uh, Alejandro Porter and Ruben Tomba. Puerto Ricans of definitions of culture and identity are not an obstacle for social mobility and incorporation to the United States. Instead, scholars must, must acknowledge how inequalities and power have mm -hmm. shaped Puerto Rican migration, which immigration policies are part of it uh, because uh, immigration non-immigration uh, policies affect not only non-citizens non -citizens immigrants, they also shape uh, uh, US citizens like Puerto Rican. While revealing the ways in which Puerto Rican migration policy developed, a sponsored migration is also an invitation to understand the incorporation of Puerto Ricans into the United States, their second class citizenship, and even the role of race and racism in their incorporation and the importance <coughs> of that it played in US colonial policies. In the end, however, even after all complaints received in Puerto Rico since 1900, migration remains for many Puerto Ricans the only alternative to survive 
or in the case of migrant farm workers, is the only alternative for staying in a colonial order devastated by the policies of austerity and now by Hurricane Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here to celebrate, uh, to share this celebration with all of you, and uh, also uh, to uh, perhaps open up a dialogue uh, this wonderful presentation that we have heard before allows me to move uh, perhaps to a different perspective a little bit uh, because it's uh, clear what we have in the book. I just want to refer to what I have learned from the book and where the book takes me. Uh, I come from literature, as you know, but nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way I read and, um, uh, and I'm here to celebrate a powerful, uh, timely, important new book. Uh, a book not only about policy and the creation of the colonial state, uh, I would say, but also timely because it is a book about the moral and the political failures of our political elite. Uh, I think that's uh, very important in this book. Uh, there is a sort of quiet passion in the way that Edgardo presents all this to the reader, um, even though there are pages uh, that reminded me of what uh, a great uh, scholar and activist, Edward Said, uh, one of the persons that I really have admired and had the pleasure to know personally. Said, uh, I heard him say more than once, there are days when one feels like screaming. Uh, and this was a very powerful intellectual who was also a passionate uh, person in, in view of his Palestine uh, case, and he fought for that as well. And these are days when one feels like screaming about Puerto Rico, right? I'm sure many of you share that with me. And there are pages in this book that, uh, even though I read them sort of quietly, made me feel like screaming once more. Uh, there are, uh, there's food for thought here. Over a book of 230 pages of text and over 25 pages of densely packed endnotes. And as the book proceeds, it becomes clear that a study of sponsored migration gives us entry into many other uh, many other aspects of the Puerto Rican and the contemporary world experience through the Puerto Rican experience, with Edgardo as our expert guide. When one reads the introduction, the key words, and as a reader of Literature, I love key words, it's important. Uh, what they mean, the key words in the introduction are crucial here. Migration, colonialism, and citizenship. And it is like, the, it allows us for a thread to, to read the book as well. And we are reading this book these days I read it before uh, the hurricane, of course, and it was written right before, in the midst of the terrible crisis that Puerto Rico has been living in the last years. And even more so now, the questions of citizenship, money, debt, colonialism, these big questions, which we are facing now, uh, what I would call a galvanic moment, a real galvanic moment, shifting the character of the debate. And this book is part of that moment. And even though the writer Edgardo was conceiving the book right before this crisis deepened, he was very much aware when one reads the beginning and the ending of the book, the final paragraph, that he was fully aware that this book was going to be published in a very dramatic 
moment. Uh, dramatic because of what yesterday, the other day, we attended a, a small reunion, two of uh, the Puerto Ricanos in Newark, and one of them referred to the three C's, capitalism, colonialism, and climate change. So the Puerto Rican questions, in the plural now, but the questions of questions rise yet again. They loom large in the horizon. Part of those key words have had different meanings in the past, and we are now facing a new wave of migration. We have had uh, in the last years, and even more so now. Uh, the landscape has changed, as we read the book. Literally, tragically, and more metaphorically. But there are continuities, especially if we reread some of the books that we have been able uh, and fortunate to have, like this one. Edgardo Melendez's urgent, insightful, and engrossing sponsored migration is really an essential guide to understanding the most controversial political and social processes of colonial modernization in Puerto Rico, and I would say in the world, as an example. The whole process in the book, throughout the chapters, is examined with a sharp eye for detail and an uncanny ability to focus on the internal feuds and rivalries between the Puerto Rican government, the colonial state, the federal government, and some states. The stories, and there are many stories, I like the book because there are stories, and he's a good storyteller too. That's important. Uh, we don't want economists or sociologists or even anthropologists <laughs> if they cannot tell a good story. I'm sorry. And this is a book that has great stories in the sense that they are revealing, meaningful, multi-layered, richly layered, and very often disturbing. Edgardo takes us into strange and secret places of power with truths that cut to the bone. The main thesis, I think, is clear in the book and very clear from the beginning about the colonial state, on page 27, the increased role played by the Puerto Rican government in the late 1940s in managing migration to the U.S mainly has to be related, he writes, to the relative autonomy in local affairs and vice versa. Migration was significant in increasing the colonial state's management of local affairs to Puerto Rico. This tension or duplicity, I think, is the core of the book. And duplicity is a word that I think characterizes also the Puerto Rican political elite in this book. And piecing together trips, interventions, must some of the well-known characters, others not as well-known or forgotten, uh, he tells those stories and illuminates a tumultuous period that created the modern economy and the modern colony. It was not 1898. The colony is not always the same. That's important. And right now we are at a different moment when perhaps there is a different colonial situation. Who is Edgardo Melendez? I ask that question because you know, very often we have to discuss books with uh, some of our readers, students, colleagues, friends, who don't necessarily know where the book comes from. And I think it's important because this book has to be has been written by someone who is deeply, deeply uh, concerned with Puerto Rican issues and has had a long preparation to write this book. I think, I think that's important to remember. Uh, his books and essays, particularly his previous books, Colonial Dilemma, Critical Perspectives on Contemporary Puerto Rico with Edwin Melendez, published in 1993. And then his state, the State Movement, an important book. And his Puerto Rican government and politics, a comprehensive bibliography, all have to be remembered as preparation for this excellent study that we have uh, here. But even more so, his recent work, his more recent work contemporary with this book, 
Edgardo is one of the most important voices among Puerto Rican and Caribbean academic and intellectuals who are deeply engaged in debates concerning uh, citizenship and integration uh, to metropolitan political culture and discourse. I would only uh, refer to his excellent essay. I highly recommend, I've been recommending this essay, uh, as Edgardo knows, on Vito Marcantonio and, and uh, on the New York 1949 mayoral campaign, but it reveals about uh, Puerto Ricans, especially about the Partido Popular Democrático Muñoz, but also about Vito Marcantonio. It's a, a wonderful, excellent, insightful essay. And also, more recently, the, the, the really uh, absolutely necessary edited volume with Charles Bernardo that Central Journal published, spring 2017, from which we have been learning so much. Those, that volume really was published uh, and uh, recently and will become even more important uh, because of the quality of the essays, the new research, and uh, I think that uh, Gardo and Charles Bernardo deserve our great admiration. And it's also a preparation for this volume because there are many references to citizenship in this study that refer to that uh, what the questions raised in that volume as well. And as I said before, I want to move to what I have learned with the time that I have, to the time what I have learned in this book, and I have prepared a PowerPoint that I want to uh, I have because it helps me to illustrate what I referred to. And let's move to the next one, because I have chosen a few quotes from the book and also uh, some other aspects that are not necessarily included in the book, but the book has led me to rethink some of the issues. Let's look at that quote, where I think is, uh, it says, as in the Philippines, the process of, the col of colonial state building and colonial governance in Puerto Rico <coughs> were interrelated. Building the colonial state implied colonial rule on the island. More important yet, both processes require the cooptation and cooperation of local elites. To me, that's a key quote in the sense of the major thesis of the book. And I also think it's important the comparison because it's inviting a comparison with the Philippines, with other comparable colonial situations. Uh, this is not strictly a Puerto Rican issue. That's very important for the way we look at the Philippines, but also the fact uh, of studying elites. It is true that we have many, many wonderful studies of Port now, fortunately, of Puerto Rican workers, of Puerto Rican independentistas, not enough. We always need more activism. But we have less studies about the elites in Puerto Rico. That's important, because whether we like it or not, and this book is a good example. They have had the power, and they still do. When one looks at the news to these days, no? in the midst of the hurricane, you can see clearly uh, who are the members of the elite and how they talk about the country and the language they use and the way they establish their relationship with Washington, D.C., or with FEMA, or with the president whose name I do not remember. <laughs> and also, uh, this is a book not only about the elites, but about complicity, about duplicity and complicity. And that's a very important aspect of this book. Let's move on, thank you. I have another quote here, uh, which is uh, at the end, towards the end of the book, and I think it's uh, a sense of an ending, as uh, one of my uh, intellectual heroes has described. You know, and let's see what he says there, because it's, important, I think, because it summarizes the relevance of this book for today. The end of section 19, uh, 936, along with massive corruption and incompetence by successive Partido Popular and Partido No Progresista administrations plunged the island in a spiral of economic and social disarray that uh, has persisted into the 21st century. And I jump to the last. For many Puerto Ricans today, migration is seen as the best exit strategy in a crumbling economic, social, and political system. That's towards the end of this. The question is, 
they may translate very important question. What went wrong? Because the book describes this great project, great quotation mark, uh, modernizing project, migration project, the colonial state. But the book ends with a really uh, disturbing conclusion uh, in the midst of the uh, so-called debt crisis in Puerto Rico and the possibility uh, of looking at this as total collapse of a system and total collapse of a project. I think that's important. And that's part of the spirit of this book as well. Uh, let's move on to the next one. This is, I'm sure you have seen similar uh, pages like this. This is from the New York Times the mm -hmm. other day, and there are many more now. And I was, uh, while rereading parts of the book, interested in that, of course, title, brutal in many ways, uh, shocking to many, but, but it's related to this book. For many on Puerto Rico, the most coveted item is a plane ticket out, huh? which is deeply related to this uh, study. Uh, the, the airplane itself, I'm interested because it's not just migration, but migration in a plane and a new way out. Albert Hirschman wrote a beautiful essay on exit, mm -hmm. voice, and loyalty. And the airplane has been, for many of us, uh, a possibility of exit, individually and collectively. And this is now comes back with a vengeance and with a really serious vengeance. Let's move. <clears throat> the book led me back to my. Uh, how should I call them? Some of my bad noirs, some of the books that I have read, hated, uh, made me scream uh, many years ago, and I, I still have in my archives. And one of the book, one of the many books published in the 1950s, uh, is this book that I'm sure many of you know. One of the many books, but an important one, a, a truly important one. Uh, this book by uh, and his quoted in, in your book, too, uh, Earl Parker Hanson. That's why I chose this one. And I kept my own copy of this book for many years. And I went back to it. Why did it bother so much, me so much, that book? There's something in this book by, uh, uh, by Edgardo that is political history. But I would say, and I want to underline that from my perspective, it is a book that raises an important question. How do we write? intellectual history. How do we write the history of ideas and the history of political language? Because many would not consider Hanson an intellectual, he would be a propagandist. But there are many like Hanson, intellectuals as a matter of fact, academics, who really worked as uh, propagandists for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, for Muñoz, or for the Migration Project, and this is one of those books that there are many uh, books similar to, or essays, that we need to go back to that production and see that production and the role, the political role it played and how influential it was uh, among Puerto Ricans as well, but also in the United States, mm -hmm. that we don't know enough yet about the consequences of that, uh, that history in the United States. I'm going. Let me know if I'm wrong with the time, because I, I, I sometimes I, how, many, how much time do I have? Uh, for you? For me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, how about 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Let's move then, because I want to show. I have, I have one quote from that book, because it is important in the book. It goes back uh, also. It's not the, the, the colonial state had the period of migration, and the period of migration, of course, is based on population control. Or as the great Karl Marx said, and Marx is not quoted, unfortunately, in this book, but he's there somewhere, the surplus population, no? <laughs> disposable population. He should have been quoted, but he's not. Anyway, uh, maybe Edgardo thought it was not necessary. No, I. I I had to cut a lot. Yeah, you know. but here it is. And this is not Marx, 
but handsome. It's amazing. The discourse of population control, of overpopulation, the dogmas, the colonialism, no? Uh, look at that, the words, for me the words are important. With the universal fertility of the poor, he writes in 1955, the Puerto Ricans kept shooting children like cannonballs at the rigid walls of the economy. Amazing. 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 And this is what is implied in some of the statements that we hear today. Too many of them. And they keep having children. And, and then uh, children kept coming, he writes, the population kept growing, the means for supporting the population diminished. And at the end, if the United States did not do something drastic about Puerto Rico, the colony would blow up in our hands like a firecracker. It's so important to, to really go back to the language itself. No? The language that dealt with so-called from enlightened point of view about overpopulation and too, too many Puerto Ricanos. No? And of course, this is part of the book in the sense that migration was one of the responses to overpopulation and to biopolitics, the biopolitics of the colony. And the biopolitics of the colony has not been the same always. There are different chapters in that story, as we see here. And Edgardo's book raises the question again. No? Let's go to the next one, please. Yes, and then I want to, one of my favorite quotes, I, I insist this book takes me back to the need for a, different intellectual history, or a history of Puerto Rican intellectuals, because we're so handsome. But this is Salvador Tio. And Salvador Tio was one of the intellectuals of the Partido Popular Democratico, mm -hmm. Banco Buena de Fomento, Biguier films. And he was very much involved with Biguier. And this is, someone is studying this, someone I know is looking now into the Biguier archive in Puerto Rico, an instrument of the government for migration, but also for uh, population control. Let's look at what Salvador Tio said in, in 1949, published. No? Desde Alberti, the Argentine intellectual, y la fórmula era y sigue siendo buena para la Argentina, gobernar es poblar. Para nosotros, gobernar es despoblar. And this is one of the most prominent intellectuals of the Partido Popular Democrático. Not all intellectuals were independentistas or socialistas. No? You have to remember that. And this book leads us to that chapter, unwritten <coughs> chapter, of the intellectuals of the Partido Popular, and what language they use, and how they propose, what they propose. And, and he goes on to say, podemos despoblar emigrando, podemos despoblar reduciendo los índices de natalidad. And then the end, no? Eh, producir cada día más y aumentar la producción mucho más rápidamente que la reproducción. This is in a, in a, in a, a magazine, a revista published here in New York. And, and published, I think, financing part by the Puerto Rican government. That's why I said, no, the revista, no, in New York. And that is Salvador Tio, as many others. Uh, of this, of that part. Let's move on. <clears throat> One aspect that I find is fascinating in this book, and also leads back, Edgardo does not practice what some would call, I would call, cultural history. He doesn't need to. I mean, he's providing all these wonderful uh, sources and examining them from a political point of view and giving us all this material. And he raises the question again, fascinating for cultural historians, just like literary uh, historians too, but the airport. And these days I've been thinking a lot about that too because we have been now looking again at airports, no? Who is where? Mm -hmm. Isla Grande, Isla Verde, La Base Muñiz is being used again by those who have money and can, uh, you know, get all these private planes. Where is, the, where is the U.S. military? What airport are they using? What happened to Raymond Hill? The airport. And this is a wonderful book that I used to, on a few occasions in some of my seminars, Naked Airport, because the history of Puerto Rico and this project and the colonial state and migration, as Edgardo shows beautifully, is linked 
also to airports, to modernization, to that particular space, and continues to be that way. That's important. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at airports as a space, an important space in our history, too. And to perhaps deepen our knowledge of that history. Let's move, just a few minutes. Because uh, airports, and Edgardo says in his book, uh, the idea that, it's, that, it, that, uh, that the airports and the importance of planes in Puerto Rico are due to tourism is not true. I agree with him. It was mainly migration, and he makes a point of that in the book. But it is also true that tourism to the Caribbean islands was very much part of this modernization, and there is this character there. Uh, I don't know if his name is the Trip, uh, who was the owner uh -huh. of an American Airways, and he was very influential in government. And this is one of the early posters for Caribbean tourism that is included in that book for Pan American Airways. What strikes me is that these Puerto Ricanos from the early, in fact, were very up to date in many things. They were interested in the transformation of capitalism, in these ventures. Uh, they were modern in so many ways not always democratic, it's not the same. You can be very modern and very anti-democratic, right? So they were fascinated with technology and fascinated, in this particular case, with, with the possibilities of air travel and airspace, both for tourism, but more so for migration. I think you're right in that sense. And we have to place that history in a larger context of the role of the airport, the industry, uh, I like this book, Naked Airport. Naked refers to also to, to the great architect, uh, one of the great architects, but also to Newark Airport. That was one of the first airports and very modern and very important. Let's move on, because I have a few images. Uh, Edgardo uses in his book archival material, images, beautiful images, from the, from the cover to the photos that he includes here. And he also led me to look for other images, similar images. I think his use of archival material, also not just sources, but images, is fantastic in the book. This is one of those new airports you know, in Miami uh, uh, by, by this uh, same person, for the very wealthy, uh, by Juan Tripper, his character from Pan American Airways. Let's move. And this is an artist in the Newark airport. That's quite a story in that book. Uh, I'm just showing these images because the airport had become an icon of modernization, of, of uh, the avant-garde uh, for many of the dismodernizadores. Okay? And then it turned, uh, it turned uh, in a different way to migration. Let's move. Yeah. The, the La Guardia, mm -hmm. 1930, that was important in New York. OK, I don't have time. Let's move. This one, too. New York, too. I chose the New York images, all from that book. Make it airport. Let's move. Thank you. And then uh, this is a very uh, interesting for me quote from Edgardo, uh, and he goes right to the heart of the matter here. Uh, I argue here that the major force behind behind the expansion and modernization of the air transportation infrastructure actually was migration. The number of airlines and flights, not all that, uh, linked to the dramatic increase in the number of Puerto Ricans leaving the island for the United States. The, main, the original view here is not just that it was not tourism, but migration, that you see the dispossession of people and the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people linked to uh, the avant-garde technology of air transportation. That's amazing. That's really uh, one of the aspects that really uh, leads us to say that the Puerto Rican history and the Puerto Rican situation should be at the very center of global studies. Because this is amazing. And the modernizadores Puerto Ricanos were very uh, aware of that, too. They were aware that they were the vanguard of technology and the vanguard of capitalism. And they wanted uh, half of the population, at least, to play a role, a very, a very sad role in that project. Let's move. And then, of course, Aeropuerto Internacional de Isla Verde, 1953. So that's, when you see it in the context of the development of airports 
And this is, I like this photo because this photo is also a good portrayal of, of that elite. Technocrats, intellectuals, no? Morales Carrion, historians, and the celebration of the airport. But also a good photo that I can use to show how inequality really works, which is what Edgardo is showing us. Let's move. And this is in chapter two, he says, uh, the, not only encourage, and this is important in my reading, that the government in the following decades not only encouraged the migration of Puerto Ricans to the United States, but also facilitated and organized. And he's referring here to one of those characters, Tierra Verdecia, half forgotten, and now he comes back in this wonderful storytelling by Edgardo. Tierra Verdecia acknowledged years, years later the government's policy of not encouraging migration to the United States was part of its public relations campaign to prevent opposition to Puerto Rican migration in the United States. And if we don't encourage it, no, we don't, we don't, we don't, we do, but we don't. We do, but we don't. Uh, it's amazing. And that's part of the, of the importance of this uh, chapter to here about the elites and not, neither encouraging nor discouraging migration. Let's move on. And then also in chapter five, uh, the school system, the education. It's so important now that the public education system in Puerto Rico is really on the par. And you know, sometimes you have the feeling there, I feel like screaming, what's going to happen? What's happening in the public education? And now after the hurricane too, no? What's going to happen? What's happening? public system. Let's look at this. In the public system, the government was reaching prospective migrants, be they adults or children, etc. They were able to expand the pool of prospective migrants. By the mid-1950s, two agencies of the Puerto Rican government, the Departments of Labor and Education, were instrumental in the promotion and organization of migration to the colonial state. That is, uh, and he is supporting that with a lot, a great deal of research new sources, direct quotes from these characters in this story. Uh, I was screaming at that page. I leave it there uh, because I have so many other things. Let's just show the last photo, the last one, please. I, I have my own archive of photos, that one in particular, because that is not in the book. And that is one of my questions. Uh, because while this was going on, Edgardo knows perfectly well, that 1947, 48, 49, 48, La Venta de Vieques, 48, the great, uh, one of the great strikes at the University of Puerto Rico, the return of Alvisu, uh, the role of the Partido Independentista Puerto Riqueño in those years. There were critics uh, of that uh, colonial state. Those critics uh, paid a high price too, and it was the the, the years also the same year of La Ley de la Mordaza. So one aspect that is perhaps not enough uh, uh, developed in the book is the fact that there were significant Puerto Rican critics uh, of that colonial state and of those modernizadores, not to mention the fact that writers, Pedro Juan Soto and Pere Marquez and many others were really so visionary that they saw it from the very beginning. But this photo I, I have in my archives too. I'm sure you, many of you know this photo uh, in 1948. They were waiting students at the university. Some of them can be easily identified waiting for uh, Alviso, who had returned to the island. And we could also refer to other independentistas and socialistas, not just Alviso, who were extremely critical from the very beginning of this project. I leave it there. I want to celebrate. This is a great book. This is a timely book. This is a book that we should read and more necessary now, post Hurricane Maria. Gracias.
to Teresita, uh, Ismael, and Alcario for uh, all those wonderful words uh, about myself, about, about the book. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, basically to hear about what these people have to say. Uh, I'm very happy about that. I could leave uh, right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, several people told me to be brief, right? That's very important, so I, I, I'll try to follow that guy. Uh, I've been in several of these uh, events, presenting books, my, my own books and other people's books uh, before. I never know what exactly what to do. So I asked Teresita a few weeks ago if she could give me an advice, and she gave me a great advice, right? Just say what the book is about, what, uh, what was my journey uh, regarding the book, and why uh, do I think it's, it's important for me and for other people? And of course, she also told me to be brief, so <laughs> again, uh, I try to stick to that. Uh, uh, in short, uh, as most people that know me, uh, I've been working on this stuff for a long, a long time now. Uh, it seems like forever. Uh, Initially, it was to be a, a chapter of a, another project on Puerto politics in the US. And of course, you know, the way things work. Uh, one day I went to uh, the Archivo General in Puerto Rico. I said, you know, let me start with Puerto Rico migration policy. I have heard so many things about that. Uh, but really, nobody has examined this, this topic. Do you have anything on this? And the guy brought me two big boxes. And in my head knows I achieve all right. All full of dust and uh, there's no organization. Uh, and there are so many more like there. Wow. Is it going to take me more than a couple of days I thought initially? Uh, and so it did. I don't remember even what the book was about. I've been working on this uh, ever since, right? Uh, for, for a long, long time. And it, as it happened in most research, once you start doing research, one thing leads to another. It's like, you know, pulling umilito, you know, you start pulling yeah. the thread, and all of a sudden, you never, you're never able to stop. Uh, and then you start dealing with one topic, and then the topic becomes a chapter, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, it, it, it's been, a, a, in a sense, a long project. Uh, and the research has been very, has been very, very fulfilling. But once you start the research, you also have to start to think about what's, what the meaning of all that, you know, what's important of this research and uh, what's behind it, right? Uh, what are the big theoretical or analytical issues, right? Uh, for me, as a political scientist, it was very important. What's, all this has to do with colonialism, isn't you? and so on and so forth. Uh, let me read, so I think I'll, I'll be faster, if you don't mind. Uh, as a political scientist, I have been frequently asked, what is a political scientist doing studying migration? Of course, Ismael pointed to, to some of that, right? The study of migration is usually left to sociologists and anthropologists. With the exception of Manuel Baldwin Alves, back in the 1960s, Marolin, right? Uh, Puerto Rican political scientists have not been interested in migration. Even in the US mainland, very few political scientists, with some notable exceptions, have been inclined to study political politics in the US. So when asked the question, what is a political scientist doing studying migration, my short answer is, in Puerto Rico, few things could be more political than migration itself. <laughs> to fully comprehend Puerto Rican migration to the US, we need to understand the context under which it happens. And that context is based on Puerto Rico's relationship to the US and Puerto Rican's relationship to the American state. In other words, to fully understand Puerto Rican migration, you need to relate it to Puerto Rico's colonial status 
and Puerto Rican status as U.S. citizens. And this is just for tax starters, because as it usually happens, things are always more complex than what they appear to be. Almost everyone studying Puerto Rican affairs today understands the links between migration and U.S. citizenship. Uh, US, uh, U.S. citizenship has not only defined the nature of, my, of their migration process, but also its direction to the United States. So the fact that Puerto Ricans were citizens in 1917 doesn't mean that they were acknowledged as so once they moved to the U.S. mainland, among several reasons. It was precisely because Puerto, Ricans, Puerto Rican migrants were not acknowledged as citizens and because the rights of citizenship were not recognized, including the right to work in the U.S. mainland, that the colonial state had to intervene in the post-war period, not only in the process of organizing the movement of, of its people to the U.S., but also in the process of incorporation, in the process of the incorporation of, of its citizens in the United States. It was because Puerto Rican moving to the U.S. were still being treated as citizens of Puerto Rico and not fully as U.S. citizens. And I have to include a footnote here. I'm, I'm sorry, it's my academic nature. A footnote asterisk. For those of you that might have some trouble understanding this notion, right? That, that, that how are Puerto Ricans perceived as US citizens, please see Trump Donald, comma, <laughs> Hurricane Maria, comma, paper towels. <laughs> Going back to the question, what is a political scientist doing studying migration? My other answer is, when the previous explanation doesn't really satisfy the person on the other side, well, really, I'm studying migration policy. And that could be more political, and what could be more political than policy itself? That is, policy deals with the actions of the state mm -hmm. towards its people or towards other people outside its jurisdiction, as in foreign policy. In the case of Puerto Rico, the state includes at least two major levels. The metropolitan state, call it the US government, the federal government, you know, whatever, and the colonial state that directly manages local affairs in Puerto Rico. What exists in Puerto Rico after the Farquhar Act first created, after the Farquhar Act first created it, the colonial government in 1900, is a colonial state that has assumed different forms ever since, and that includes the Commonwealth created in 1952. I'm sorry, another footnote <laughs> regarding the colonial state. Right? Footnote, please see Puerto Rico government, comma, fiscal crisis and debt, comma, Congress, comma, promesa, comma, Supreme Court, comma, Puerto Rico versus Sanchez del Valle, comma, Hurricane Maria relief effort, comma, FEMA, comma, again, Trump Donald, comma, paper towels. Since 1900, uh, both the metropolitan state and the colonial state in Puerto Rico have been directly involved in the process of migration or have considered the idea of migration for multiple reasons. An important one has been migration as providing stability to the colonial regime on the island. Since 1900, the colonial state, in different forms in different periods, has intervened in the process of migration from Puerto Rico to the United States. Throughout many decades, several institutions and personalities of the US government have spouted migration as a means of providing stability to the colonial regime on the island. The U.S. institution, for example, the U.S. institution in charge of managing colonial affairs in Puerto Rico for many decades, the Bureau of Insular Affairs of the Department of War, uh -huh. the same one that managed the process and definition of U.S. citizenship to Puerto Ricans that concluded in the Jones Act of 1917, was also involved in managing migration to the United States for many, many years. So there was a precedent for what the Puerto Rican government would do in the post-war period regarding migration. But what the Popular Democratic Party, uh, the PPD government did after 1947 was in many ways unprecedented in nature and scale. It developed and implemented its own migration policy and created a vast bureaucracy to carry it out. A bureaucracy that extended not only throughout all of Puerto Rico, but also to the US mainland. It created agencies like the Bureau of Employment and Migration in San Juan and the Migration Division in the United States mm -hmm. to organize the flow of both individual migrants and the organized migration of Puerto Rican farm workers to the United States. Through the Farm Placement Program, it moved tens of thousands of farm workers every year to work as cheap labor in U.S. farms for more than three decades. 
They use the major means of socialization as it is also, including the bigger bureaucracy in Puerto Rico, the Department of Education, as well as, as its radio and TV stations to instill the idea of migration on Puerto Ricans. The goal was to make every Puerto Rican a potential migrant. It played a central role in building a modern and efficient air transportation infrastructure to facilitate the movement of people from Puerto Rico to the U.S. mainland. As I can mention, uh, the International Airport, the one we see every day on the news nowadays, was built by the Puerto Rican government, uh, opened in 1955. Whatever you might say about this policy, it is evident that it played a central role in the migration process of Puerto Ricans in the post war period. Mm. So, what is the meaning of all this? Why should anything uh, said here tonight, uh, or anything that you can read in the book, should be of any importance to you? Puerto Rican migration to the U.S. is a central aspect of the Puerto Rican experience as a whole. If you were born, uh, if you're a Puerto Rican born in the U.S., there has to be someone in your past that came from Puerto Rico. We are not native to this nation. And for Puerto Rican born and raised on the island in the post-war period, migration has been a factor that has influenced all of us in many ways. This is evident in the unprecedented number of people moving to the U.S. mainland in the last 15 years. And that was before Maria. Everything indicates that migration will be a very important issue for people in Puerto Rico and for U.S. Puerto Rican communities in the U.S. for the foreseeable future. Many of you might be asking yourself how any of this, uh, how any of the things discussed in the book might be relevant to you today. This is, of course, a fair question. We still can see it, uh, today some of the legacy that the government's post-war migration policy left behind. Many of the post-war Puerto Rican communities in the U.S. were influenced by the government's migration policy, for good or for bad. In many cases, the growth of Puerto Rican communities outside of New York City needs to be linked to the government's policy of moving migrants away from New York City in reaction to the so-called Puerto Rican problem there after 1947, or it can be linked to the farm placement program. Many workers stay behind uh, and did not return to Puerto Rico, moving to nearby cities and stimulating the growth of communities there. Mm -hmm. A very important legacy of the Puerto Rican government's post-war migration policy is the development of what, cap, of what might be called a culture of migration among Puerto Ricans. U.S. and Puerto Rican colonial functionaries since 1900 constantly complained that one obstacle to a policy of migration was that Puerto Ricans did not want to migrate. They did not want to leave their homeland. One of the most important consequences of Puerto Rico's post-war migration policy is that it made migration not only possible, but also accessible. For example, by providing efficient and reliable air transportation and cheap airfares, while encouraging people to migrate through programs like the Farm Placement Program <coughs> or through the use of the Department of Education and other means of socialization. Mm -hmm. Migration came to be seen in Puerto Rico as an alternative that is available to all, no matter class or status. Every Puerto Rican, in fact, became a potential migrant, a major goal of that policy. Nowadays, hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans are leaving the island once again. Again, even before Maria. For many, migration, for many, migration is seen as an exit strategy, what I was talking about, as a way of escaping the collapsing colonial order in Puerto Rico. Most do so without acknowledging that hundreds of thousands did so in decades past, and that the spaces that institutions created by these previous migrants make it possible for current ones to enter the U.S. without the extensive and rampant prejudice and discrimination experienced by earlier generations. Most Puerto Ricans are also unaware that the island government once created and sustained a vast structure that made it possible for Puerto Ricans to migrate to the United States. Some of that legacy is still visible for those living in the island today. The contemporary air transportation infrastructure in Puerto Rico that allows Puerto Ricans to take a plane to the U.S. or to Puerto Rico at any time at little expense needs to be linked to, the, to Puerto Rico's post-war migration policy. Mm -hmm. The Rick Munoz Marine International Airport, which has become a symbol of migration, that different image we have seen after Maria, that crowded airport with desperate people trying to catch a plane. Uh, 
the international airport, as again, as, as, as uh, Claudio mentioned, has become a symbol of migration. This airport was not built by the Puerto Rican government in the mid-1950s to move U.S. or Puerto Rican tourists back and forth to Puerto Rico. It was built to move Puerto Rican migrants, and it still does. I am very glad that Arcadio is here with us tonight for many reasons, uh, among other things, because I, why, I would like to, as, uh, as my concluding remarks, I would like to use his concept of the memoria rota, the broken memory. He argued many years ago that both war Puerto Ricans have developed a broken memory regarding three very important aspects of Puerto Rican history that were never discussed or talked about. Colonialism in Puerto Rico, militarization of Puerto Rican society, and migration to the United States. Although migration was something affecting the lives of all Puerto Ricans, there was really no major public debate or academic examination of the issue until the 1970s. The publication of Bertanto Vega's uh, Indispensable Memoirs mm -hmm. and the groundbreaking labor migration under capitalism published by, Cent by the Central History Task Force are important markers in this new awareness of Puerto Rican migration. Of course, many, many more words have come after that. But although many scholars mentioned the role played by Puerto Rico government in migration, there was not really a profound examination of this topic. Mm -hmm. this is this is one important reason why I decided to spend so many years with researching this topic and eventually writing this book. There are many more areas and issues to explore in this regard, but I hope that my book might contribute, however small its contribution, to mend this broken memory. Thank you, muchas gracias. Thank you, Arcadio. It's an honor to be in the same stage as you. And uh, Eduardo, thank you for sharing uh, and for your uh, inspired words about what it all means. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, we have about 10 minutes because we want to give enough time for Eduardo to sign some books um, with beautiful dedications. So, profe. <laughs> claro. Solo quería hacer dos comentarios. Uno con respecto a, a la política migratoria que se inicia en la década de los 40, que me parece que, que aunque se ha mencionado un poco, me parece que es importante destacar que la política migratoria fue parte de una política más amplia, que fue la política de bregar con, la, eh, con lo que llamaban el exceso de población, pero Correcto. el exceso de pobres realmente, uh -huh. Correcto. con la desigualdad. ¿no? Uh -huh. Entonces, no solamente eh, que se estimula la inmigración, sino de quién, de qué sector de la población es el sector precisamente que va, está bajo el nivel de pobreza, porque el objetivo fundamental era reducir la cantidad de pobres, ¿no? sacándolos del país. Uh -huh. Entonces, hoy día me parece que esta, esa política que entonces se comienza por la vía migratoria, por la vía de control de la natalidad, ¿verdad? Nos estalla en la cara a nosotros ahora porque tenemos una reducción negativa del crecimiento poblacional en términos de, eh, de la fertilidad y por el otro lado la emigración, ¿verdad? Aumentó exponencialmente y en esa, y en esa emigración nuevamente volvemos a tener más de un 50% de migrantes que son pobres, o sea, que el problema de la pobreza que entonces se trató de resolver empujando la salida de este sector bajo condiciones de pobreza y desigualdad, 60 años después, 70 años después, sigue siendo más o menos el mismo, con unas características distintas, claro está, pero con una población que tiene unas características parecidas a las de aquella época, porque es ese sector mayoritario el que sigue emigrando. Entonces, ese sector inmigrante nuevamente se relaciona con la metrópolis de una manera diferente a como se relacionaba en aquella época. Porque hoy día se van hablando y en Orlando entonces hay otros problemas relativos a ese sector de ausencia de vivienda, de ausencia de, eh, de servicios para esa población que va esperando desde la perspectiva de Puerto Rico ¿verdad? y del welfare state en Puerto Rico un, una, una atención semejante a la de Puerto Rico, pero esa no es la que van a tener allá. Y hay otra problemática totalmente distinta. Eso por un lado. Pero por otro lado, quería hacer un comentario sobre el tema de los aeropuertos. ¿no? Yo soy ahora mismo una refugiada climática, porque pues salí corriendo de Puerto Rico tres semanas después del huracán. Y, y voy a mirar 
explicar el aeropuerto desde otra perspectiva, desde la perspectiva del que vive en una isla y se sienta atrapado. Mm. O sea, porque de repente eh, no había aviones. Of migration today is that the state is not there, the colonial state is not there, not there. right? And uh, we can argue. But not in the sense that it was until 1970s organizing migration and trying purposely to, to, to have people leave. Now, it's, as I tried to mention, it's, it, this is linked to, to that, right? The, the, the whole legacy of the, of the migration policy is that, well, we, by now we, are, uh, uh, we know how to migrate. And the airport is there. And there are communities there. And by the way, all the links of the U.S. with Puerto Rico had to be defined in terms of where the Puerto Rican uh, communities are. Of course, now there's tourism uh, in addition, right? But that's where, that's how the the the, the routes, the air, airline routes, were defined initially. And then we have you know going to Disney World and all that stuff, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Just one. Uh, oh. Oh. No, no. Prior to Irma, right, the professionals and the elite were leaving, right? Oh, yeah. The doctors, the nurses, the oh, teachers, yeah. because they make more money here. But now, in Maria, lo que se van a ir son los pobres, porque no pueden. Ahora mismo, no pueden dar a los pobres por vida. Mi hermano, tuve que mandarle a otro hermano un paquete porque no recibí un paquete. Correct. So, you know, it's, it's a really different perspective. But to wrap things up, I'm sorry. I just want to ask you something real quick. I got to say something really interesting because. All along, there are moments that I have when I read material that make me really scream and angry. Yeah. What made you angry? Like, when you're doing all your research, what stood out for you? Oh, when I put it on top. What the? <laughs> I think that, that uh, 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 Arcadio has much better ways of saying this kind of thing than I do. But I think he pointed to it. It's the, the anger you get from he reading, not only from news reports, but from the documents themselves. Yeah. The government officials saying, you know, we have to you know, do this and do that. We have to uh, move people out. Uh, for their own good. For their own good. For their own for good. For their own good, right? Uh, and then they came up with all these uh, crazy theories of overpopulation, right? The quote that Arcadio said, oh, we, we're going to be flooded with people. But, but, but really, uh, uh, it's, it's a conscious policy by a sector of the Puerto Rican elite to manage colonial affairs. Yeah. And not only colonial, the colonial elite, because the metropolis was part and parcel of this process too. And that's also one thing that I oh, try yeah. to point in, in, in the book, and every, and every time I have to say something about this, because Puerto Rico is a colonial territory. So the metropolis, and the, one of the functions of the colonial state is to maintain colonialism. So the metropolitan state, the federal government has an interest in whatever the government does. Well, it used to have before Trump, right? Now, nowadays, we don't know. Uh, so, uh, and I think Arcadio and Ismael pointed to it uh, very clearly, the function that migration has played in Puerto Rican history. Not only regarding Puerto Rico itself, but Puerto Ricans living in the United States. I think that's an important thing we have to keep in mind. I think uh, it's an important part of the Puerto Rican experience as a whole. Yeah, well. That uh, although we nowadays tend to pay more attention to migration, there are some areas that we still need to go out and, yeah. and, and, and dig in and see what what was in there. Uh, and yeah. this was one that, for me, made me angry because nobody had ever really, really paid attention to the role that the colonial government played in this. And for me. Whenever I start digging into all those dusty, messy uh, boxes, I, I, I see one and I say, wow, this is right here. I mean, this is not, this is not hidden, right? If you go to the book also, it, look at the references. Yep. Page one of El Mundo and Imparcial. This wasn't done in, 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 in close quarters. It no, was done no. right there, you know, it was front page El news. Mundo there. But then yeah. we never, yeah. you know, we had to wait until the 1960s and yeah. 70s for people to say, you know what? By the way, writers were at the yeah. vanguard, right? Yeah. Luis the Rafael, oh. René Marquez, oh. Pedro Juan Soto. But Mi academics, you know, it took us, you know, 20, 30 years to say, wow, there's something in there that we should pay attention to. Uh, and that, in a sense, makes you angry. And, and by the way, we all, I, 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 I was raised in Puerto Rico. 
And that's why I like to quote uh, uh, Arcadio's great metaphor of the broken memory. Mm. It, was, it was present mm. all over the place, but we never saw it. Not well, at, at the university. We never, there huh? were no courses at the no, university. No, nothing at all. Yeah. By the way, not even today. Not even today. Not even today. Just, just two quick comments, uh, 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 because it's so important. First of all, on the question of islands as prisons mm -hmm. and islands uh, as parad you know, I, I think the islands in the imaginary can go either way. The, mm -hmm. the idea of paradise, but the idea of prison, too, have been there in the collective memory of many countries. No? Islands uh, can free us and can also prevent us from freedom. Uh, you know, there are many literary texts that deal with that, and I think many uh, Puerto Ricanos too have dealt with that too. Um, and uh, that's very interesting. I was moved by what you said. Uh, and one, one uh, comment on that is that uh, I was also thinking about uh, military airports and the Air Force, because at the same time, uh, I have a photo there of Muñoz with Korean uh, veterans, Puerto Ricanos, veteranos de Korea. 1952, the, the year of the Commonwealth, is also, you know, you see all these photos of Muñoz in El Mundo. On the one hand, migration, on the other hand, welcoming the veterans. That's another terrible, tragic, I think, contradiction too. And they were brought in by ships, and some of them were flown, uh, and they left Tortuguero, and they have, you know, it's interesting too. And the whole island was a, full of bases. I mean, it was Vieques too. So islands and their meaning uh, from the military point of view as prisons and also as pre Puerto Rico. Yeah, so the meaning of the island, that's a very important question. The other thing is, you know, related to La Memoria Rota, as a matter of fact that, uh, if I can say, if I can say a personal note here, you know, I come from a very, very huge, large family from Guraba and Caguas. Uh, I was raised in Puerto Rico. But I had 15 uncles and aunts on one side and 12 on the other. They all migrated in 1947, 48, 49. And I was raised in Puerto Rico because my father and my mother were of the few that remained in the island. Uh, and they were all, not only populares, muñozistas. So I grew up, I didn't even know any independentistas until I went to the university. Uh, but I grew up as a muñozista, you know, he was a hero. Then as a student at the university, I, I realized that my whole family, I mean, that world disappeared, Gurawa and Caguas, totally disappeared. And there's a trauma there too. Um, and I came to visit them in New York, everywhere. Now they're in Orlando, they're even in Houston, um, sons of and children of us. A very Puerto Rican experience, no? Uh, and, and yet, that was not part of my education. Mm -hmm. My own family was not mentioned. I mean, it was, and very often, not even among independentists and socialists, I became one, no? It was not a chapter that was important. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And yet today, as Centro has, keeps reminding us, we are five point, Edwin, how many now, five point? Five point and three point, whether we like it or not, that's the Puerto Rican experience now. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, and it's very moving that the diaspora, in this moment of crisis, I am sort of uh, you know, moved and also hopeful because so many uh, people, groups, activists in the diaspora have really made talking about exit voice, their voices heard, and loyalty is there, no? That's important. Whether we like it or not, um, they changed our society, these modernizadores, you know, they did. Uh, so, you know, there are days when I scream, but on the other hand, there are days when I say, well, this is, we need to rethink everything for the future, because this is part of a very complex process now. So we have Ricardo Paya book, have Ricardo sign your book. Thank you for being with us. Thank